Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Streche, and Yu Pizka as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Good afternoon and welcome back to beautiful Amsterdam. We are at KubeCon Europe and it is so bright and so lovely here in Amsterdam. They're actually letting me keep my shades on today. Very excited. Thank you all for tuning in for this wild first day of coverage. Very excited to welcome our next guest. He is the CTO of Minio. Yes. Please welcome Ur. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Savannah. Great to meet you and great to be on the show. Great to meet you yeah. too. This is your first time on theCUBE. Absolutely, yes. I feel very <laughs> lucky to give you the warm welcome. Thank you so much. Brave of everyone to trust me with this, but I, but I appreciate it. <laughs> So, uh, in case, uh, you're a pretty big player in the game, but just yeah. in case folks aren't familiar, what does Minio do? Minio is a high performance S3 compatible object storage. And when what does object storage mean, exactly. just in case? The, yeah, we are at the Kubernetes show and most people luckily knows here. about object yeah, storage here, sure. so we don't have to define it at the, at the show here, but just for everybody else, object storage is basically blob storage large binary object storage that is different than, there are three types of storage in traditional sense, block, file, and object. Mm -hmm. Block and file is designed with different protocols and different hierarchies and structures, but most of the time in traditional sense in the last 20 years or so, they were designed for inside data center. Mm. Whereas object storage combined with AWS S3 APIs meant to be for across the internet, RESTful APIs, warm storage, large scale, high performance with MinIO, and it's meant to be for putting large blobs of storage and managing the storage and data persistency in objects, in blobs. So that's the biggest difference between a file system, a block storage, which is quite raw, and file system with a hierarchy and an iNode table and some technical ways of managing it in a, in a structure. Whereas object storage is very plain, uh, in terms of namespace, there's no structure and hierarchy, it's just one flat namespace. And with MinIO, you can get high performance. And AW, thanks to AWS, they open up the whole path for us to build a very high performance and scalable data persistence solution for the enterprise and for new technologies such as Kubernetes. And that's why we are here in this show in KubeCon. I mean, speaking of Kubernetes, you describe, you self-describe as Kubernetes native. What does yeah. that mean to y'all? So it's very simple. We started with containers. When containers were Starting out, MinIO was starting out as the open source um, object storage solution in that world. And we have written everything in Golang that is um, very efficient for certain things that we wanted to achieve. And it was about 40, 30 to 40 megabytes of a static binary, the whole solution, the whole MinIO server, the persistent storage stack is all that. We, when we put the UI in it, it became a little bit larger, about 100 megabyte, but still dramatically slow compared to what people do with appliance solutions or other uh, software solutions. Yeah. We achieved something really special in a very lightweight binary, and it was so easy for people to take that and build it into containers and start that way as their solutions. So that's one aspect. RESTful APIs and S3 APIs made it more interactive uh, from an SDK perspective or mm -hmm. an API. The applications could write into MinIO easily. That's made it really easy for microservices, hence cloud native. Yeah. And when Kubernetes came to a orchestration play, yeah. it became so much easier for people to choose, put us as a container, create a persistent layer, use our erasure coding, which is how you protect data. We use erasure coding. It's an algorithm mm -hmm. similar to RAID, which is a data protection in the traditional sense. We use erasure coding to protect the data, so they can put multiple containers, use erasure coding and MinIO, protect their data, and have cloud native and microservices easily talking to that and use it as their persistent storage solution. That's you, why it's cloud native. You've said a you've said a word that we don't hear often yep. associated with Kubernetes a lot. You've said easy about four times. Yep. Talk to me a little bit more about that. We're all about decreasing complexity. Yeah, so MinIO itself is easy from yes. an operational perspective. Many of our customers choose MinIO to drive operational costs down. 
And it's because... Also a huge theme right now. Yeah, as fraction of an FTE, full-time employee, is needed to support MinIO compared to other solutions, other appliance or other software solutions out there. Storage is complex if it's not done correctly. MinIO focuses on simplicity, and we have only done S3 protocol, S3 APIs, and full stock, full stack solution for enterprise. That's why we are easy. That's why we need a lot less. You're focused. We are very focused, and it's simple. Literally, you can take MinIO yeah. binary, run a one single command, and start using uh, MinIO S3 compatible storage on your laptop for a developer right away with access key, secret key, immediately. So that's the reason that. why we are simple, mm -hmm. easy in Kubernetes because we have spent three to four years of engineering time to develop our operator. Operator is a framework or a concept within yeah. Kubernetes to deploy the same application or containers within Kubernetes with a logic that's built into that operator's Kubernetes at scale, uh, configuration. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. So you can easily scale it. You can deploy multiple tenants. You can deploy a MinIO cluster here, cluster there within the same framework. You use the worker nodes from Kubernetes and PVs, which is the storage, raw storage that Kubernetes uses easily deploy it, that's why we spend three years of engineering time to get our operator right, so that we can deploy into Kubernetes. On you. Hence, people here pay a lot of attention to MinIO boot, because they like that idea of using an operator to deploy their persistent storage solution. I believe that, and, and you've certainly, it seems like you've really honed your market. I know some of the world's biggest companies use you. Can you tell us a little bit about your customers? Yeah, we have more than 260 customers at this point, and a lot of it goes from traditional use cases where people who are doing video streaming, like world largest streaming, and you know people who are <laughs> into... Sorry. <laughs> it can be any of them, they're in competition. Yeah. <laughs> so from streaming to Hadoop replacement stories, we have different spectrum of companies that are using uh, MinIO. So MinIO can be used as a traditional object storage, Yep. And MinIO can be used as a data, modern data pipeline in a Kubernetes environment. So we have different workloads and different use cases. And within Kubernetes with AI ML workloads, especially if people want to separate compute and data, if you're not into the classical Spark and Hadoop uh, mm -hmm. workloads, and you want to have a query engine that is separate than your data, they come to MinIO to create a modern data pipeline. So a lot of our modern AI ML workloads are running on Kubernetes mm -hmm. with a data pipeline that uses MinIO. That's awesome. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. What, what are you seeing in the data landscape right now? It's kind of a wild time. So data landscape is dramatically changing. Everybody, yeah. The whole buzz, buzzword in the last six months has been ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And that itself is kind of the tip of the iceberg with AI ML workloads where you have a lot of training um, data sets going, that the, the data sets are growing I incrementally. Like it's just so out of control to a degree that now it's not about the amount of data, but it's also how to get that data uploaded or put into the uh, data storage systems. Yep. So at scale, so MinIO focuses on performance. We have done a few tricks with uh, the chipsets, we use something called SIMD instruction set, which is available in most chipsets, AMD, Intel, even ARM. We compile the code for that. So we use special registers on the chips to get our erasure coding fast. Oh, wow. So CPU. So it's down to the system hardware level. Yeah. That's we, awesome. It is, it's flags, and it's available on all commodity chipset. Mm -hmm. And we use those to, uh, do, to have a high performance erasure coding scheme in our software. And the CPUs are idle for throughput. So object uh, throughput, essentially, the client data, application data. When you combine that, it's easy to do performance at smaller scale. But in AI ML world, with chat GPT and training data sets, and the, 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 the models are small, in essence, in terms of data sets. But when you train a data set, you have to take multiple checkpoints, and the, the output of that becomes about the same or a little bit less, but you keep multiple truck points and that exponentially grow the data set that you are getting. So that is the biggest shift in that data landscape. And we are benefiting from that because we store all of that data, raw or otherwise. And the other aspect of it is we do performance very well at scale. Mm -hmm. A lot of people- You're all about scale, right? I we mean, are totally on scale. Yeah. I mean, object storage is about scale. MinIO is on hyperscale because we 
did these tricks and the CPUs and, you're scaling and the registers scaling. and it. So exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when people in AI world, AI ML world, when they want to upload these large data sets yeah. and have multiple checkpoints of that, multiple iterations of that, they want to upload that fastest. And we are the best there. One of the competitors. You say the world's fastest, by the way. We are the world fastest, that's for sure. And we have benchmarks and we are open about it. We published it on our blogs. It's there for people to see it. Love it. Look at it. I was just going to ask about it. I, I mean, and we, we challenge our competitors to use the same hardware and publish their results. Love it. We are all about that. Because we are very confident about the low level things we've done at the assembly code level to the. We invested the time to yeah. make the best product. We, we did day one. Like SIMD yeah. instruction set in Intel chipset is called AVX 512. That flag is allowing us to use these special registers to be fast. Mm -hmm. So we are quite confident on that. And the data landscape changing with ChatGPT and AI, ML, data training, all of that data models and training the data sets, we are in the right place and we are getting the benefits of that. We are working with one of the competitors of ChatGPT, is, work, is testing on MinIO, trying to get a big data set right on as fast as possible to the server side, to the MinIO storage, to the yeah. S3 storage, so that they can do multiples of them and get it, the training as fast as possible. So the game is to get those data sets and get the checkpoints and data pipeline up to the story system as fast as possible, and we play a great role there, and we are the it's best really, in that market. I mean, market. the speed is so important on both sides. You see it with people using ChatGPT, they get frustrated if there's lag time. Yeah, that's We're the talking front, about yeah. seconds, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's on the front that's end. That's the front end, If yeah. you have, you know, and but everything we're going in on, on this end is getting yeah. stored, so that you know, it's this two-way street all at the same time. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. When, when ChatGPT came out, and I love that you're working with one of the competitors, did you feel, did you feel excited? Did you feel validated? What did you guys think as a team? No, we we got we felt so good about the fact that the data models and training that data is becoming mainstream now, that everybody has to do that, mm -hmm. and that creates a huge market for us. I mean, that's the, that's the part that we got so excited and got validated, because we were always about large amounts of data and storing, but it's easy to take archival data and store it because it's low performance. Yeah. That's not what we do best. We do, what we do best is large scale, high performance data. Right. And when ChatGPT came, we saw, okay, that's only text, you know, language uh, training, and uh, there's the voice component to that. There's the image component to that. There's going to be more people going into more bots and more uh, AI ML training of data for different use cases, and that's going to explode the amount of data sets that's going to be stored. It and already it, is. It, it is already yeah. there, but that's what the validation is. That was the front end validation, seeing it um, middle of the road, common use case, everybody loves it, everybody uses it, and there's going to be more of them, and we are in the back end of that. So the future is bright for you. Very bright. Fantastic. Or thank you so much for being mm -hmm. here at MinIO. Check them out. This has been fantastic. And thank all of you for tuning in. We are here in Amsterdam at KubeCon Europe. My name is yep. Savannah Peterson. I'm here with theCUBE, the leading source for high-tech coverage. Perfect.